From Focal Point Radio and Radio Fairfax in Fairfax, Virginia, this is the Mimi Gerges Show. In October 2010, NPR news analyst Juan Williams appeared on Fox's The O'Reilly Factor. He said this, I mean, look, Bill, I'm not a bigot. You know the kind of books I've written about the civil rights movement in this country. But when I get on the plane, I got to tell you, if I see people who are in Muslim garb and I think, you know, they're identifying themselves first and foremost as Muslims, I get worried. I get nervous. NPR fired him for making those comments. They said his remarks were inconsistent with their editorial standards and that they undermined his credibility with NPR. Needless to say, the firing of Juan Williams set off a firestorm of controversy, dwarfing whatever initial controversy had come out of his original statements about Muslims. Juan Williams has written about this experience and what he says is the assault on honest debate in America. His book is called Muzzled, and he joins me in the studio. Juan, welcome to the program. Maybe it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. I want you to start by giving us the background of this incident. This started with Bill O'Reilly. He was a guest on The View. And he was asked about why he thought Muslims shouldn't be allowed to build a mosque near Ground Zero. And he said, quote, because Muslims killed us on 9-11. What happened next? Well, Whoopi Goldberg and Joy Behar, who are two of the co-hosts of the five ladies who are the host of The View, walked off the set in protest. And only when Bill O'Reilly said, I was talking about radical or extremist Muslims, did those two ladies come back? And then it became like a little media circulation bubble or something where all of a sudden it was the dominant male conservative white O'Reilly taking on the liberal ladies of the view over insensitivity in the way that he was speaking about Muslims in the 9-11 attack. So the next day that O'Reilly had his own show on the Fox News Channel, I was his lead guest and he said to me, Juan, where did I go wrong? And I said to him, Bill, I'm not going to play politically correct games with you. The people who attacked us on 9-11 were Muslim, and they were citing their faith as justification for the attacks. They spoke of jihad, and they spoke of all of these kinds of religious ideals as part of what they were doing. And I said, in addition to which, the Times Square bomber uh, had been in court the week before, and he spoke about... Uh, what he had done and what had happened previously with 9-11 is simply the first drop of blood in a Muslim war with America. And then I added your comment, Mimi, that I said, in fact, when I go into airports, if I see people in Muslim garb, first and foremost, identifying themselves as Muslim, uh, then I create some anxiety in me. But now that's what the start of it was. That was a bridge to a larger point. And the larger point was we're a nation of religious diversity. We should not be stereotyping or categorizing anybody. We don't say Christians are violent based on the behavior of Timothy McVeigh or the Atlanta bomber or right. what I consider to be the offensive rants by the Westboro Baptist Church. Mm-hmm. And I said all this at the time in the segment, in this fast-paced environment where you're doing debate on cable TV. But NPR and the Council on Islamic uh, American, American Islamic. Islamic Relations basically accused me of bigotry. Now, at the time, did you realize that what you just said was going to be so controversial? Not in the least. And in fact, you know, it's interesting that you asked that question, Mimi, because people sometimes say to me, do you ever have a moment in the shower where you say, if I'd only said that differently or I should have said something else? I've never had that moment. And I have those moments all the time because... As a news commentator, as a public speaker, you think, oh, if I'd only said it differently, I forgot to mention this. But in this regard, nothing, because I said all that I wanted to say. In fact, when the NPR executive who called to fire me began the conversation, she said, now, what did you mean to say? I said, well, I said what I meant to say. And then she went on to say that it was inconsistent, as you described it, Mimi, with NPR standards. I said, what are you talking about? Saying what I feel is thoroughly legitimate, and it was in broader service to this l- larger point about religious div- No, no, we don't want to hear it. I said, wait a second. Can I come in and talk? I'd worked there 10 years, and I said, I'd like to be able to talk to you about, no, nothing you can say or do. This has been affirmed higher up. We're terminating your contract. You're fired. This was over the phone. Over the phone on a, you know, late, about 5, 6 o'clock on a Wednesday night, this had happened. The show had happened on a Monday night. I then traveled to Chicago to give a speech. People at the speech 
very supportive. Well, that was great what you did with O'Reilly last night because I was saying to him, Bill, we do need to be careful so that you don't inspire people like this minister down in Florida to burn the Koran or somebody to think, oh, this person's a Muslim. I'm going to cut their throat. We've got it. We don't want that in America. That's not America. Uh, so people were very encouraging. And Mimi, let me tell you, this is a kind of poignant story. I'm in the airport at O'Hare coming back. And a man comes up to me and says, are you Juan Williams? And of course I say yes. And he says, well, I saw you on the show last night. And I want to tell you that he realized it wasn't just enough to be a suburban businessman outside Chicago, that he needed to get involved in changing the image of Muslims in America. And he just wanted to thank me for speaking out about tolerance and about how important it is to understand and not be politically correct, to understand the challenge that Americans face in the aftermath of 9-11, where there is a direct connection between radical Islam and terrorism, not to turn away from it, but also to say that Islam is part of the fabric, the quilt, if you will, of religious diversity in America. So this man, who's a Muslim, is complimenting me. (laughs) But the next day, then, when I'm in New York, I get this call late in the afternoon firing me. Juan Williams is in the studio with me. He's a veteran Washington journalist, political analyst for Fox News, and formerly a senior news analyst and host for NPR. So you mentioned this before, the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE, they, as soon as you were on O'Reilly, they immediately got to work to try to get NPR to fire you. Correct. What did they do? Well, this is interesting. Uh, They launched an internet campaign, I guess, uh, you know, trying to encourage people to write to NPR, calling for me to be fired, uh, Again, because of what I had said, suggesting that what I had said amounted to bigotry. Um, I don't know if they thought that they couldn't get Bill O'Reilly fired because I'm not aware that they were bombarding Fox with such emails. But they thought that NPR would respond. And in fact, NPR did respond. Uh, And there's a subtext to this, Mimi, which is that I think NPR was looking for a reason to get rid of me. And part of it was that they consider Fox to be an anathema to be not a legitimate journalistic organization, uh, too many conservatives, too many conservative points of view in prime time. You had had been working for Fox and NPR simultaneously. Correct. And in fact, I was working for Fox since 1997. NPR hired me in 2000 to be their afternoon talk show host. So they, I was working for Fox before I was working for NPR. But as I was saying, There had been questions raised over the years about a prominent NPR personality also being a personality on Fox, because we live in an era where journalism is more and more like you're supposed to be on the liberal side or the conservative side. People tune in to hear opinions that oftentimes affirm pre-existing points of view. And so here I am talking to both sides. And so sometimes, especially the NPR audience would say, you know, how come he crosses the eye? Like, I didn't see it was a big problem. Most managers who came through NPR in that 10-year period came to the conclusion, actually, he's not saying anything on Fox. He's not saying on NPR. It spreads the word of the NPR brand. It's good. But the last uh, level of managers that came about really said, we don't want you to identify yourself as NPR when you're on Fox. We want to know what you're writing. We want to know any book proposals that you have out. Uh, And so they were trying to diminish me. They cut my salary. They were trying to push me out the door. And I think that this moment then, with Keir launching this campaign against me... It was a convenient excuse. That's right. Now we can get rid of him. You said that you didn't fit into their view of how a black person thinks. Well, one of the managers said that to me. He said, you know, you have conservative social views. And I guess this was based on a book that I had written called Enough, which is a book that talked about, you know, what's going on in the black community in terms of out of wedlock birth, 70% of the children born to single mothers. Look at the high dropout rate. Look at the high incarceration rate. Uh, You know, look at what we're doing to ourselves in our community in terms of dysfunction and how it is that we don't speak honestly about it. Bill Cosby, the famous comedian, African-American, had spoken out about this at some point, and the response was, you're airing dirty laundry, Bill Cosby. You shouldn't be saying that. And Bill Cosby said in response pretty famously, your dirty laundry gets out of school at 2.30. It's walking down the street, threatening people, smoking a joint, cursing. Everybody knows what's going on, and you, you're trying to hide it from people instead of dealing honestly with the topic. Anyway, it's, it's, it's very similar to how 
the, the Muslim community has to kind of look inside themselves and say, look, I think we've got a problem here. Correct. But there's a reluctance in both situations, as you just said, Mimi, to have people take responsibility, to be accountable for what's going on inside your community, rather than creating devils on the outside that they say, oh, therefore, we can't speak honestly to ourselves. And in, you know, we can't speak honestly to our children in both cases about what is going on in our community and how they can succeed in America and how they can escape this trap. So the basis of the NPR executive's comment was, you know, you talk to conservatives on Fox. Oh, my <laughs> God. And I said, well, yeah, that's good. I go out there. I debate. I'm not affirming their point of view. Most times I'm in point of dispute with them about what they're saying. And he says, well, yeah, but you, you're friends with Clarence Thomas, who's a Supreme Court justice, the black conservative. I said, yes. And you know Condi Rice. And all. I was like, you know, what is going on here? What is wrong with having people who, knowing people and having friends who are conservatives? So does that now mean that you're a bad person? Well, you know, it makes a lot of the executives here on Comp they don't like it. You know what? That's craziness. So when you ended up getting fired, how did you react? Were you stunned or were you kind of like, well, good riddance? No, I was stunned. I got to tell you, I'd worked there 10 years. And also I felt very threatened. Uh, I remember that after I got off the phone with that lady, I didn't know what to do. And I, in looking back on my behavior, I think I was stunned because I just carried on like nothing had happened. I went out and ate Chinese food. I had to do a show later that night. I just, I didn't call anybody. My wife wasn't around. I couldn't reach her. And then it was only I was supposed to do a show with a red-blooded, hard-line conservative, Sean Hannity. I went on his show, didn't talk about it. It was afterwards, Sean Hannity said to me, something wrong with you? You okay? And I'm like, well, if you ask, I just got fired. But that was really the first person that I shared this with. And it was only because... He sensed that I was upset. And in fact, as you say, Mimi, I was stunned. It, one of those moments where I thought, you know, NPR has their big microphone. They're all over the country. They're in every market. And in fact, they then put the word out that they had fired me. They were so proud of it. And their thing was, we've been warning him. He's not a good journalist. And I'm like, what is going on here? You know, I felt like nobody was ever going to hire me again, that I had been tarred and subsequently, you may remember, the president of NPR goes before TV cameras and microphones and says whatever Juan Williams said should have been kept between him and his psychiatrist. And, and Saying that you were mentally ill. Oh, yeah. And that, and that I uh, was unstable and that then also that I should have a – that my publicist was dictating whatever it was that I had to say about this. Like I was so infantile I couldn't speak for myself. It was an incredibly threatening moment to me because – so many people love the NPR brand, know the NPR brand, and would think, oh, well, they must be right. And this individual and this journalist, he must be wrong. So I felt like, you know what, this could be the end of the line. And I was scared. For your career. Correct. What ended up happening as far as the reaction goes once, once everything became public? I understand that NPR was flooded with emails and phone calls. You know, I don't know, but I, I, what I read was that the ombudsman, who was a woman at the time, said she'd never seen anything like it. And not only in terms of the phones, Mimi, but the Internet had so many uh, emails coming in that it shut down. It was overloaded and broke. And this was emails in support of you? Oh, absolutely. All in support of me. And this, you know, the, this book muzzle the assault on honest debate people say to me so this is about npr firing you and i say well no actually what happened in that moment this flood of response is what happens that the american people said wait a minute you know I, he can't say that he just is anxious in the airport they said you know what it's terrible there's so many things now in this country you're not allowed to say if you're having a discussion a debate people will say oh you're a crazy right winger shut up or you're a crazy left winger. Shut up. Or you know what? You can't have a conversation about immigration without somebody saying, oh, you're just offering amnesty to these illegals. Or you just want to open the borders, don't you? You don't care about anything. And or 
you hate immigrants and you just you're just hating you're on racist. immigrants mm-hmm. and you're a racist mm-hmm. and a bigot. I mean, we can go on. How about guns? The NRA says if the minute you talk about gun control, you want to take my guns away. Or let's talk about abortion. Oh, no, let's not talk about abortion. Let's bring the Bible in as if the Bible should dictate all the laws in the country. So suddenly you just realize there's so many things now that you're not allowed to say in service of an honest discussion in this country. The book we're discussing is called Muzzled, The Assault on Honest Debate. Juan Williams is in the studio with me. He's a veteran Washington journalist and political analyst for Fox News. Well, let's talk about 9-11 and Islamic terrorism, because you start the chapter on that subject with this question. Is it possible to talk about Muslims and terrorism without being called a bigot? Is it? It's very hard. It's, I mean, look at who you're talking to, me. <laughs> look what happened to you. <laughs> look what happened to me. It wasn't only that <laughs> they fired me. They then tried to tar me. And, you know, I spoke a moment about Bill Cosby and his experience in terms of the black community and calling attention to problems there. Here I am as someone who's written books about the civil rights movement, about people who have been willing to put themselves on the line to create social change in America, progressive change, what most would call liberal change. And I still get beat up tossed out the door and demeaned as a result of trying to talk about Muslims and the link between extreme Islam and terrorism. This is, to my mind, also the case, time and again, that anybody who tries to speak honestly on this topic finds themselves being vilified by one side or another, but specifically by lobbyists and special interest groups that say that they represent the Islamic community in America. Like CARE. Exactly. And there are some that would say that you should never use the term Islam or Islamic with terrorism because it has nothing to do with it. How do you respond to that? Well, it seems to me this is interesting. President Obama and his administration have tried to, in fact, not use that word terrorism with regard to Islam. They just call it extremism. We're struggling against extremism. Or, as the Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano said, man-made disasters. Man-made disasters like, you know, flying an airplane into a building or trying to put a a suburban car in Times Square filled with explosives or at Fort Hood opening fire on people in a cafeteria area. That's a man-made disaster. It's not to be called terrorism. I, I find this Orwellian. I mean, it's like you're not supposed to say what's going on here. How do you think that fear of offending Muslims is actually playing out in policy in Washington? Well, you know what? The thing is that we have two levels of discussion here. One is that President Obama and the administration and the fear of associating jihad. I mean, just think of the root of that word and how jihad is used and how Osama bin Laden used Islam as a way to recruit people to engage in terrorist activity the promise of great reward in heaven, the idea that you're not supposed to, for example, make a documentary about how Muslims treat women. That's why Theo Van Gogh was killed over in Europe. Or the idea that there's a woman here in the United States, a political cartoonist named Molly Norris, who simply said, you can draw characters of Jesus Christ. Why can't you draw a caricature of Muhammad? And as a result, she faced so many death threats that she is still, as we speak today, in hiding for her own protection under FBI uh, surveillance. This is unbelievable. This is happening in the United States. In the United States. This, these are people who are being silenced. So, you know, when you ask me about policy, the policy angle is the next level. You have all of this pretend, oh, we can't call people terrorists, we can't speak about Islam and, its, and radical Islam and its relation to terrorism. But at the same time, guess what? This country now has more security. If you've lived here over the course of the last 10 years, you know this is a different country. You know there are barricades in front of buildings. You know airport security is heightened. You understand that just to drive down the street in Washington now, I mean, Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House, a little aircraft flying overhead now, all of a sudden there are F-16s around it. It's such a different place. And our civil liberties have been impacted in terms of the Patriot Act and the laws that have changed our surveillance of our internet communications, our telephone communications, monitored in a way that we would never have tolerated before in this country. 
all of this is a reality. And yet, on the surface, you have people saying, well, you can't, you can't use that word terrorism. We don't want to do that. We don't want to offend people who are Muslims who might think that we are trying to link Islam and terrorism. And we want to be very clear, this is not a war on Islam. Well, you know what? Right from the start, President Bush went to visit a mosque, to make it very clear. This was not a war on Islam. But that is not to ask people to obscure the reality that there is a clear link between radical Islam and terrorism. And you you talk about an incident in 2010 when President Obama was visiting India, and a student asked him his opinion on jihad. What did he say? He did. You know what? He danced. Mimi, it was a it was a, an exercise in obfuscation in which he he talked about jihad in terms of its religious meaning, a personal journey, a struggle, an effort to achieve you know some sort of righteous standing in your own life with your conscience. Which, he, by the way, has nothing to do with how. Orthodox Muslims view the word jihad. I mean, that's kind of a new... Is that right? Yeah. See, I don't know that. Tell me. Maybe. I mean, it has always been a violent struggle from the beginnings of Islam in oh, the 7th see, century. I don't, see, I don't even know that. I mean, we, I am, I'm listening. He's going on and on. And obviously, the question that came from a young person, a college student, was about how jihad was being used by the people who had perpetrated the terror. But he didn't want to say Yes, of course, and it, and it's illegitimate or whatever. He was speaking in his understanding of what was the pure theological interpretation. But here you are telling me that's not even right. The book we're discussing is called Muzzled, The Assault on Honest Debate. Veteran Washington journalist and political analyst for Fox News, Juan Williams, is in the studio. I want to ask you about another journalist that was fired for something she said, and that was Octavia Nasser. Yes. She's the Middle East editor for CNN, and she tweeted this, quote, Sad to hear of the passing of Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Fadlallah, one of Hezbollah's giants I respect a lot. You know, this is a situation where then CNN says, oh, wait a second, Hezbollah has been linked to terrorist activity. How can you be tweeting your admiration for this man? And it's, and again, you're fired. You're gone. Without understanding that this man had been involved in so many charitable, civic activities, helping people in his community. And so you disagree with this firing? Oh, yeah. You know what? And again, this is another example of people who behave in a knee-jerk manner this woman was a very good journalist. And this woman was not expressing sympathy with terrorism, which is what is the real basis in CNN's action, firing her, the suggestion that she's supporting terrorists. Talk about a distortion. There's no evidence of that. I don't, I've never seen any reporting that would suggest that, oh, no, Octavia had previously been saying words of support for terrorist activity. All she said was she was sorry this man had died, who without a doubt, I don't think there's any argument, was a giant in his community. Now, if he was a giant in his community who had also been involved in sponsoring terrorism, supporting terrorism, I would say, oh, CNN, I understand what you... But no, he had simply had a tie to Hezbollah. But remember, Hezbollah actually serves as government in large parts of the Palestinian community. So, Juan, when did all this happen that we became so politically correct that we couldn't really have honest debate about things and, and become so polarized about certain subjects? You know, let me, let me add one thought, if you don't mind, Amy, on this Octavia thing. When you, when you close the door to someone who, first of all, is much closer to the Arab community and to their experience, then you are really closing a door in terms of understanding and I just thought it shut down a discussion that could have been illuminating for an American audience as well as for the Arab world. So, But I, I think even though he was still affiliated with Hezbollah, which is at their core a, a terrorist organization. Yes, absolutely. I, I, and he never clear. renounced his links with Correct. them. He never said, you guys, we're going to stop trying to kill Correct. Israeli c- civilians. Right. But he was – right. My point to you was he was not someone – who was a terrorist. He never committed terrorist act. He wasn't involved in funding or supporting or excusing terrorism. You're right in saying he never renounced it. But the larger role that he was playing, that she was commenting on, was his role as someone who was a provider in that community of charitable ends, jobs, 
uh, someone who helped to provide stability. And I don't think there's any question that the Palestinian people have been through some very difficult times. And here is someone who was trying to be a positive force in that community. All she said was that she was sorry that he had died. That would lead me, if I was an executive or a news executive, to say to her, well, many people would view him as someone who failed to renounce links to a terrorist organization, Hezbollah. So why are you doing that? Explain to us why people in the community would feel sympathy for this man. And I think it would have been good journalism, a good, honest discussion. But it got shut down. So when did all this happen? The, the political correctness and the shutting down of, of honest debate? Well, you know, it's all around us now. I, I just want to say this also comes from people on the right. Remember Ari Fleischer, President Bush's press secretary, saying, be careful what you say. But this really, this really predates all of this. You have to go back to the 60s. And, and I tell this in the course of writing Muzzled. When we start with political correctness as an effort to try to take out, you know, racist statements, misogynistic statements about women, the women's movement all comes about in the 60s, the civil rights movement, that even talking about people who are disabled, how we speak about people has consequence in terms of our thinking, our opinions, and of course our action. And then people start to say, this is becoming too orthodox, and then there's a backlash. And then you get to the point where people are saying, oh, it's so PC. You can't just say what you want, it's so PC. So it seemed like political correctness had gone away. But then around the course of 9-11 and, uh, you know, the, the war on terrorism, a new PC comes in. You're not so, if you're critical of the war, if you're critical of the Patriot Act, oh, you're not patriotic. You're un-American. You're un-American. Oh, my gosh, what is going on here? On every side, left wing and right wing, you're not supposed to say this, not supposed to do this. And if you change the, the, t- the terms of conversation, if you violate them, then you're a bad person. So, Juan, what do we do about it? Well, I think one thing we have to do is be willing to listen ourselves, not just tune into people who are affirming our pre-existing ideas and positions. And I think that's what's going on overwhelmingly. Uh, if you are reading the Wall Street Journal editorial page, take a look at the New York Times editorial page. You know, conservatives tend to think, oh, my gosh, NPR, the New York Times, Hollywood, a bunch of liberals. You know, th- there's got to be a way for people to have honest conversations and not get locked in to the debate that is, you know, limiting in terms of the honesty and the willingness to have a fruitful exchange. Juan Williams, he's a veteran Washington journalist, political analyst for Fox News, and formerly a senior news analyst and host for NPR. His book is Muzzled, The Assault on Honest Debate. It's published by Crown Books. Juan, thanks so much for being on the program. Mimi, you know, it's, it's, it's rare that you have a great discussion with the host, where the host actually, I think, illuminates what the guest is saying. I just want to say thanks. It's been a f- pleasure to be with you. Email me your comments or questions to feedback at mgshow.org and join us on Facebook and Twitter. You can support this program through a variety of ways. Just visit mgshow.org and click on the link that says support.